Hi, this is Dan Cordopassi of TSG Multimedia. Welcome to Model Railroading 101. As usual, I'm in front of the camera, and John is behind the camera making everything look good. At a safe distance and out of sight. So in previous episodes, we've talked about freight equipment, passenger equipment, steam locomotives, and diesel locomotives. This time we're going to wrap up our equipment discussion with electric railroad equipment. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of models to show you, so I'm not going to go through so many specific examples as I've done in some of the previous episodes. Instead, I'm going to talk in more general terms about electrics and how they're used and what some of the different types are. Also, for the purposes of our discussion, I'm going to use the words train and locomotive kind of generically just to refer to any electric equipment, even though sometimes technically they're not trains. Uh, or sometimes a streetcar is not considered a train. Yeah, but, but they have flanged wheels and they run on tracks. Right. So. so rather than having to say, you know, streetcar or trolley or, you know, electric locomotive, you know, in every sentence, <laughs> I think it would be easier just to say train and move on. It won't so. take as long. <laughs> right. Right. So anyway, I think we can get into it. So first, let's talk about some terms, starting with the most basic. What is an electric railroad? Most model trains are electric, but what about the real thing? What does that mean? Well, just like a model, a full-sized electric locomotive relies on an external power source. Steam engines and diesels are self-contained. They carry their own fuel on board. Electric trains get their power from electricity, which is from a power plant or some other external generator. Like diesels, electric trains typically have traction motors on the axles that make the wheels turn. The difference is that while a diesel generates its own electricity to drive the traction motors, an electric needs power from an external source. So how do trains get the electricity? Now there have been a few battery-powered electric trains, but those are mostly used in industrial applications like mining. Oh, right. I've seen those too. They have the, they're have weird looking. Yeah. Those aren't really used though in like anything that has to go a long distance. It, it's more the exception, right? Yeah. Yeah. Most commonly, electric trains get their power using either overhead wires or a third rail. And electricity, of course, requires a circuit. So in the model world, that means that you need two wires from your DC power pack or DCC system to your rails. Usually, each rail carries half the circuit. Full-size trains work differently. Usually, both rails are used for one half of the circuit. And then the overhead wire or third rail is the other half. And unlike Lionel track, which has the third rail in the middle, real third rail track usually has the extra rail on the outside, often elevated slightly and under a protective cover. Yes, I've seen that before. Yeah. I think BART uses the third rail, doesn't it? It does, yeah. That's the Bay Area Rapid Transit, or yeah. I think that's what they still call it. Yeah. So overhead wires are safer from a human standpoint uh, because no one is tall enough to touch both the track and the wire at the same time. So there isn't much danger of getting electrocuted. A uh, third rail, on the other hand, because it's near the ground, there's a much greater danger. So usually railroads that use a third rail system have a fenced right-of-way. Yeah, that's the case with BART, too, because I remember when we first started doing train videos, I thought, oh, we should do BART because everyone has heard of BART. Yeah. But there's nowhere to take video of it. It's very hard to access, yeah, yeah because it's because of that, they, yeah. you know, safety concerns. There are two kinds of overhead wires. One is a simple wire suspended between poles, and the other is called catenary, and that has a contact wire that's suspended from a second wire. The reason for that is it helps keep the contact wire flat and is better for high-speed operation. Oh, okay. Trains that use a third rail system usually have pickup shoes on the trucks mounted somewhere near the wheels on both sides. Usually the third rail is only on one side at a time, but this allows the locomotive to operate if it's turned around. Also, sometimes the third rail is not continuous and may stop on one side and appear on the other side of the track. Trains that use overhead wires typically either have a trolley pole or a pantograph. This little trolley has trolley poles. It's got one here and one here. Okay. And they typically have a grooved wheel or a shoe at the end that either rolls along the wire or slides along the wire. Okay, so I think I've seen both of those. Yeah, this has a wheel, so it turns. The important thing is that it has a little groove in it so that the wire will stay inside. And the poles are sprung so that they can move up and down, which is important because a uh, regular trolley wire that's not catenary can sag like telephone wire. Uh huh. So the that allows it to you know go go up and down a little bit if the wire height changes. Uh huh. And also they have a, a rope, which is used to pull the pole down. Oh, why why do you want to pull pull down? 
Well, if they want to change poles and use the other pole, they pull oh. one down and put the other one up. Okay. And they, there's a little, uh, it shows, probably shows better on the camera than this end. There's a little thing called the trolley catcher or receiver, which is kind of like a little spool. And that would wind the wire back in there. So really this model is not accurate because this wire is, or uh, this rope, I mean, is kind of just flopping around when in reality it would be taut because this is like a little reel that keeps it taut. Oh, I think my vacuum cleaner has a little cord retrieval thing like that. Yeah. And if you let go, it makes a great noise. Yeah. So the reason a lot of these cars have two poles is because they don't work so well if the pole is in front of the car. Okay. It works better in back. So if the car is going this way, they'd have this pole up. Oh, I see. And then if they want to go the other way, they'd put the other pole up and go that way. Oh, okay. That's because it stays on the wire better when it's in back. So a pantograph is a little more complicated. It's a sprung framework that can be raised and lowered. And instead of a little wheel, it has this wide pickup shoe on the top that presses against the wire. Oh, so the pantograph springiness is pushing up, is that it? Right, because it can, it can, well, this is a little yeah, it bit. It rides along the wire. It right? rides along the wire. Yeah. So you just, you know, if the wire height changes, it can go up and down, you know, and they can collapse it, put it back up. The uh, wider pickup shoe allows the pantograph to stay in contact with the wire around curves or if the wire changes from side to side slightly. Uh huh. Because sometimes the wires don't always follow the center of the track exactly. Um, so they may, you know, it may move around, but it'll still stay in contact. So these are often used in conjunction with catenary for high, higher speeds. Uh huh. Whereas, you know, trolleys usually go slower. Mm hmm. I've never seen a trolley doing more than. 10 or 15 miles an hour. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, high-speed electrics can go, well, in, in this country, maybe 100 miles an hour or more. But, um, you know, in Europe or Japan, they go a lot faster than that. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, that that's capable of, uh, you know, a lot higher speed. Although, you know, now that I think about it, I have seen a streetcar in San Francisco, and I'm pretty sure it had a trolley pole. Uh, it was along the Embarcadero, and that thing was going at a pretty good clip. Yeah. But not 100 or 80 not 100 miles, miles an hour. An hour. No, yeah. no. Yeah. One of the most common types of electric railroad equipment is the trolley, uh, also sometimes known as a tram or streetcar. The names mean more or less the same thing. Okay. The word trolley can also be used for some electric buses and other type of equipment like cable cars. In addition to streetcars, San Francisco has trolley buses that use a pair of overhead wires, as well as its famous cable cars, which aren't really electric at all. Yeah, they, the, those muni buses with the electric things on top have been there for a long time. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I used to see those and thought it was kind of cool. And wondered, yeah. What if it runs, you know, drives away somewhere else? Yeah, then it stops. Yeah. Because <laughs> in that case, they need two wires up above because the rubber tires don't give any uh, circuit. Right. You know. They only give traction. Right. The word tram can also be applied to other things like rubber-tired vehicles that run at some airports, uh, sometimes along a little guideway. Uh, but for this program, we're focusing on electric-powered equipment that runs on rails. I've often seen these at bigger airports. They have these little automated trains that take you between terminals. Yeah. Is that a, what is that? Is that a trolley? It's kind or of a it? tram or, yeah, or a trolley, but it, those, those usually have like rubber tires, and a lot of times they have a, like a, there is a center rail, but I think it's just for guidance. Yeah, I, I've never really paid attention to the track, but yeah. I remember the last time I was in Colorado at the whatever the airport is. It used to be Stapleton. I think it's some other name now, but... Uh -huh. I rode one of those things, and I took this video of it. Yeah. Trolleys often carry passengers within cities and metropolitan areas. Uh, streetcars often have trolley poles, though some, especially more modern ones, may use pantographs. Typical streetcar is self-propelled. They often operate singly, though some can operate in multiple. And as the name implies, they often run in tracks embedded in the street. Uh, and at one time, many North American cities had trolley systems. PCC cars like this one were designed in the 1930s and were once very common. Uh, many urban trolley lines were abandoned, but in recent years, many cities have put back modern light rail systems in their place. Um, in the really old days, there were also horse-drawn streetcars, but those were obviously not electric-powered. Right. <laughs> electric horses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interurbans are basically like trolleys, but run over longer distances, such as between two cities or from a city into outlying areas. 
Uh, interurbans were once very common in North America, but many fell prey to the automobile in the 20th century. Interurban cars are sometimes bigger than typical streetcar, and they're, sometimes they're more like a self-propelled railroad passenger car. The South Shoreline in Chicago and Northern Indiana is an example of a surviving interurban. And also the, the word traction can refer to either trolleys or interurbans. So if you hear people talk about modeling traction or traction layouts, that's usually what they mean. Modern mass transit systems are used in some metropolitan areas. These usually run on their own rights of way and can be elevated at ground level or underground. Uh, many of these use an outside third rail. Uh, the Bay Area's BART system, Washington DC's Metro, the New York subway, and Chicago's L are some well-known examples. So there are also mainline electrics. And at one time, several railroads in North America used electricity to power freight trains. The Milwaukee Road, Great Northern, British Columbia Rail, Virginian, Pennsylvania, New York Central, and Penn Central were among them. Today, there aren't as many, though there are a few like the Black Mesa and Lake Powell in the Southwest and Iowa Traction in Mason City, Iowa. Electric freight locomotives range from small steeple cabs like the Sacramento Northern engine to big mainline engines like the Milwaukee Road Little Joe. Electric locomotives are very efficient and powerful. The main drawback is the enormous cost of the infrastructure required to run them. All of the trolley poles and catenary and wires and yeah. substations and all that kind of thing. On the Northeast Corridor between Boston and Washington, D.C., Amtrak and other transit agencies use electric trains to haul passengers. Amtrak's Acela is one example. One of the most iconic mainline electric locomotives is the GG1, originally used by the Pennsylvania Railroad. These were built in the 1930s and some lasted into the 1980s in regular service. The AEM7 is another locomotive that was used on the Northeast Corridor. They went into service in the 1980s. Amtrak replaced theirs only recently. Mark and SEPTA also used these. The AEM-7 has half pantographs, a common design on more modern electric locomotives and trolleys. So these look more like this, with just half a diamond instead of the whole diamond like a typical old-style pantograph. Yeah, that's weird. I went, they must have found you know, stronger materials or something to accommodate that. Yeah. The Siemens ACS-64 is the locomotive that replaced the AEM-7. These entered service in 2014. I think we have a video of one of these being pulled behind an Amtrak train when they were moving them from Sacramento yeah. to Emeryville. Yeah, because the Siemens factory's out here near us, and they're used in the East Coast, so they had to get them out there by towing them. So what about models? Electric models can often be set up to run off conventional track power, just like any other locomotive, or they can run from an overhead wire. Uh, just like the prototype, if you use a live overhead wire, you have to maintain it for the trains to run well. Overhead wires are easy to snag and pull out of shape when reaching over the layout. They're kind of elbow and finger catchers. Now with DC, using a live overhead wire for electrics and regular track power for other engines will potentially allow two trains to run on the same track. Since a diesel or steam locomotive uses both rails for its circuit and the electric uses one rail and the overhead wire, there are actually two separate circuits, and each locomotive will run independently. With DCC, none of that's really necessary, as all locomotives can be independently controlled, but some purists still like a live overhead wire. This model, for example, has a metal shoe, uh -huh. and this one has metal rollers. So these probably could actually pick up current. Some models have plastic poles or pantographs, so you really couldn't use a model like that with a live wire. You'd have to... Um, You'd have to modify it, huh? E yeah. You either need to just run it like a normal engine or change the pantograph or trolley pole. So there are some advantages to modeling trolleys or streetcars. Um, one is that they can usually negotiate much tighter curves than other equipment. So a traction layout can be very compact. Oh, that's cool. Also, basically one car is a complete train. So you can operate you know, things again very compactly and still be realistic. Sure, you could be very prototypical even with super tight curves. Right. And some traction railroads also had freight motors, which I don't have a model of, but it'd be like, basically like a trolley without windows, usually. Hmm. I mean, except for the crew, but I mean, there wouldn't be the passenger windows. So it's still possible to use them to pull a few boxcars and service industries as you would on any other layout. People who like track in the streets and urban scenery may really enjoy modeling a streetcar line. 
So I think that'll wrap up our discussion of electrics. Um, I think they're pretty fascinating and definitely opens up some possibilities as a modeler to do some different things than you might do with uh, steam or diesel or sure. you know, other types of equipment. It could add a different sort of dimension, right, to the layout. Right. Because you could have, you know, a little, even if you just had a little trolley loop somewhere in your city scene, yeah. you know, that could add some some uh, variety to the layout. Yeah. So it definitely is a cool subject. Yeah. So do you know what we're going to talk about next month? Uh, we're going to talk about track. Oh. And some of the different types and how it's used and that kind of thing. Well, I'll look forward to that one. Yeah, I think it should be pretty cool. good. All right. Well, I guess I'll see you on the next episode. See you later.